Can I trust you with something? I've been having dreams about Arrakis and the Fremen. Space Feuds, Cunning Warfare, Sandworms, and Ancient Prophecy. Adapted from Frank Herbert's famous science fiction novel, the new Dune movie is a grand, masterful epic, full of high-octane set pieces, fantastical design, and sweepingly beautiful landscapes. Today, I will deep dive into Villeneuve's new sophisticated vision for Paul Atreides' famous journey to meet his fate deep in the wild sands of Arrakis, and decode the movie's references to art, fashion, architecture, and design, which altogether provided for an incredibly refined, futuristically esoteric universe of Dune. So, without further ado, welcome to Dune's Aesthetic Analysis. One, the Exploiters. The beginning of the movie, shot one, a sweeping, picturesque beauty of desert landscape, specks and particles glinting in the wind, nature at its unspoiled best. Shot two, sand dunes pillaged by the industrial activity of loud, wearing, heavy-duty machinery guarded by an armed soldier. This opening scene is Dune's main conflict in a nutshell, an implied dynamics of oppression stemming from colonial exploit. Fremen, the native people of the desert planet, are threatened by the industrial invasion of Harkonnen, an empire-mandated space miners, who unearth Arrakis' natural resource for exorbitant profit. Interestingly, at first glance, Harkonnen's mining vessels visually resemble ticks, highlighting parasitical nature of their pursuit. And generally, throughout the movie, insects are a reoccurring analogy to Harkonnen, for example in this mysterious, creepy arachnoid creature. According to costume designer Jacqueline West, the antagonist's army's battle uniforms were also designed to resemble the look of ants. So we see that the intention is purposeful here. Harkonnen have occupied Arrakis for over half a century. To depict the ruthless, domineering nature of Harkonnen, their look of paleness, boldness and aggressive virility allude to skinhead culture, which serve to subliminally suggest possible racial tensions that come along with it. Also depicted in full combat suit, they remind of Riot Police, the image of we may know all too well in current times. This mix of references, juxtaposed with Fremen who are clearly based on Bedouin and Tuareg people, cleverly carve out a stark contrasting feel to opposing factions. Gaidi Prime, Harkonnen's home world, further reflects this ruthless, toxic feel of the invaders. A black planet, atmosphere of which obscures the sunlight due to heavy clouds of pollution. The void of color, full of techy industrial landscape, it's basically like fantasy Berlin. Just imagine Bergheim in space, and you'll get the picture. Here we meet Baron Vladimir Harkonnen, a spearhead figure of the House of Harkonnen, a symbolic image of gluttony. <sighs> An extremely obese man with penchant for using anti-gravity suspenders and a knack for constant spa treatments. Is that what it is? I think. Here we also glimpse a bit deeper into social structure surrounding the cruel baron. His bloodthirsty nephew Raba, a human computer Peter de Vries, along with an array of servants and androgynous attenders. I think the aesthetics here play on the references of industrial slash dark rave techno fashion, giving it an edge of techie mysticism. 
Baron's entourage exist in equally interesting environments. We can see here, for example, that the cutout of leather tucks of Peter's robes are cleverly echoed in interior design, both in furnishings and their tuck and roll style upholstery, and in architectural composition of spaces. The repeated linearity of composition give off a neo-skeletal feel to the surroundings, a room enclosed in kind of barren, futurist ribcage. This sort of dark techy spiritualism is also extended to Sardaukar troops, based on Salusa Secundus. The visuals here are a strong nod to medieval crusade expeditions, a morbid picture of dead, crucified prisoners whose blood serve as anointing fluid, a dark priestesses blessing the row of kneeling knights before their grim, brutal endeavor. This visual is very Knights of Templar, circa 10th to 30th century. The aesthetic communicates a historically known, religiously fueled seriousness of their troops' conviction. The Harkonnen team up with Sardaka and the Alliance seeks to annihilate their enemies. They become the ultimate antagonists of the story. Harkonnen militants' aggression comes from losing their mandate to profit from Arrakis. The Emperor orders them to leave the planet while declaring new leadership to take over mining of the spice. Enter House Atreides. 2. New Stewards House Atreides represents a different kind of rule, native to mild, humid planet full of lush forests, rocky hills and craggy shores, Catalan brings to mind the climate that of Northern Europe. And indeed we see a certain nod to European feel, especially in the cementary scene. Painted with long classic tailor coats, leather gloves, and wavy hair on the backdrop of towering tombs, hillside coastal cliffs adorned with tall grass. There is a certain poetic melancholy to this picture, invoking a visual that plays upon the values of romantic period. Long coats are repeated again in Paul's and Leto's ceremonial costumes we get to see in this scene. The arrival of Imperial Herald is a marvelous visual feast in of itself. So many hints and nods to diverse aesthetics. Maximalism of the form, militant minimalism of tailoring, African ceremonial robes, burkas, and also great to see what Daft Punk setting up an orthodox church on their own would look like. <sighs> I'll see myself out. Everything combined into visual representation of diversity in political space diplomacy. And although Jacqueline West points out to Romanov in her inspiration for the shape of Paul and Leto's looks, I don't quite see it myself, to be honest. Tsar Nicholas' famous silhouette is double-breasted jacket, yet here we see fully minimalist cut with clearly emphasized center front of the fastening. The only Russian imperial reference would be in the military chain adornment imitating aiguillette that are typical for the 19th century uniform. As for the Catalan architecture, Although we only see Artrides Palace exterior for a mere split second, I would say that the multiple tier system of the buildings, as well as specific color and texture of the used stone, remind me of Cambodian Khmer architecture, mixed with a slight hint of the British colonial architectural forms, expressed vaguely in domes and windows of the palace complex. Catalan's interiors, however, strongly depart from crafting any additional European visuals to the movie. In terms of energy, the spaces capture the spirit of traditional Japanese order of interior decor. It's very balanced and reserved. But overall, the design draws from the style of Brazilian brutalism. Starkness of bare concrete walls and heavy massing is complemented with the screens made of the so-called breeze blocks, a hallmark of mid-century modern design. Breeze blocks are interesting design feats in of themselves. 
Inspired by East Asian sun-reducing screens, the blocks were invented in the 1930s, but they cut a wave of popularity later in 50s and 60s. Just about every coastal and warm climate across the globe started to embrace breeze blocks at a time. Both residential and commercial buildings use breeze blocks with the decorative hall patterns within their design as they provided a visually pleasing and affordable way to filter out harsh sunlight while still providing ventilation. They were especially popular in warmer parts of the US like California, Nevada and Florida. California used breeze blocks to protect against large planes of floor-to-ceiling windows against hot desert sun, while Florida architecture used breeze blocks to minimize the damage of dangerous storm winds. It's no surprise then that Villeneuve's team also used breeze blocks on Arrakis for that very reason. A very well-informed choice in design, not merely based on aesthetics, but also on their function. But in Atreides Palace, they mean something altogether different. The bare, brutalist concrete provides heavy, raw, futurist feel to the interiors. The feel that is juxtaposed with an intricate, bas-relief wood-carved panels, which depict either geometrical shapes or, in more antique fashion, silhouettes of human warriors. These panels, on the other hand, give more organic, historical character to these concrete rooms, adding an air of folklore, their ornamentation laying emphasis on craftsmanship along with other objects present in the rooms. So here, the mid-century breeze blocks serve as a softening agent of the two opposing styles, a sort of blender of these contrasts. The block's use of geometric ornamentation abridge futurism and historicism with an expression of modernism that contextually meets them in the very middle. That's why, despite contrasting references, everything looks so sophisticated and works so nicely. It was a very well thought out decision. The look of Catalan interiors achieve a well-balanced, zen-like feel while giving the spaces a kind of ethereal, mystical, monastic aura. And along with the very restrained, almost aesthetic costumes, this monastic atmosphere is what lends the overall gothic feeling to the place. Which I think is brilliant in a way the movie achieves neo-gothic vibe, without relying on obvious references to gothic style. It created it in a very understated, subliminal way, in the ambience, lighting, and a sense of visual sternness. The only material reference to the actual Gothic feature, a tracery, is depicted here in Paul's chair, which is done very, very subtly, encasing it in an interesting, atypically angular form of the chair. Here again, we see combining of complex carved woodwork with the brutalist shape of furnishings, elevating the scenery with futurist lighting while maintaining this moody walnut color palette. Again, a gorgeous effect, in my opinion. The nature of monastic mysticism is echoed again in the arrival of Bene Gesserit's sisters. The costumes of the order, with their fully cloaked, imposing silhouettes, could have been drawn from a myriad of inspirations stemming from traditional attires. Jacqueline West mentions being inspired by chess piece, and honestly, I can see this. Also, she mentions Marseille tarot influence, which I can't see personally. I mean, it's a cool context regarding the character, but visually, the Marseille tarot is too generically medieval, and I just can't see it here. However, considering progression of the plot, I think it's safe to assume costume's slight aesthetic for a shadowing of Middle Eastern nature of Paul's future destination, making Bene Gesserit costumes a fantastical play on burqa, shrouding sisterhood in an air of mystery and spiritual authority that Paul will only come to witness more and more as his story unfolds. This knot may serve as an aesthetic prep, both for us and for Paul, about the Saharan world that awaits ahead in our hero's journey. 3. The Sands of Fate 
Okay, friends, so in order to properly understand why the desert plays an important role in Paul's journey, we need to look into the multi layered, complex cultural meaning behind it. The vision of endless sand dunes filling the far edges of the horizon. A primordial barren land. As a motif, the desert has an age old, highly revered position in human history. It dates back all the way to the far beginnings of antiquity. It had played an important part on and on again as a vehicle of storytelling. It is an indispensable element in creations of early literature on mythology, philosophy and religion. In ancient Egypt, people lived and died by the rules of the desert. Desert symbolism in Egyptian mythology is embodied in the ambiguous trickster god, Seth, who represents the forces of both creativity and destruction. It is to this mythology that ancient Tuareg people's animist beliefs are linked. In Tuareg animism, the desert is the primal home. The developing tradition of three monotheisms, Judaism, Christianity and Islam, originates in the arid belt which runs from North Africa through the Arabian Peninsula to the Sinai. The desert in these religions represents a wilderness untouched by human habitation, which is often a dwelling place of spirits, demons, devil or jinn. Since the desert is a locus of uncertainty and danger, it is the primal space of exclusion, exile and banishment, most prominently of Cain, the agriculturalist, who murdered his nomadic pastoralist brother, Abel. The desert is also a space of trial, most significantly of Moses, who wandered with the Jews around the desert for 40 years, or Hagar, the African slave wife of Abraham, and Ishmael, their son, mythical root of the line of the Arabs. But there are also positive connotations to the desert in the monotheisms, the desert is an environment where the air is considered to be purer, lighter and healthier, and where solitude outside of the city allows for self-realization through transcendence and connection with the divine. It is a very complex, conflicting and ambiguous trope. The desert is destructive in its dangers, in its harshness and the rigor it imposes upon the body, but also it is the creative force in the productive liberation of the soul it seems to engender. It is the wilderness to which a number of characters are exiled, but it is a wilderness which reveals itself as a homeland when the character accurately reads its signs and finds his place in the desert order. And just like in stories of old, the mythical quest for spiritual transformation is what lies ahead for Paul Atreides in Dune. This trope was strongly developed in the monasticism of the 4th century of the so-called Desert Fathers, who withdrew into the deserts around Alexandria in Egypt. It is also a theme continued in the early history of Islam, where Prophet Muhammad's meditation in cave in the desert outside of the city of Mecca provided the spiritual preparation for the first revelation. And interestingly, of the three Abrahamic traditions, it is Islam that is the faith mostly viewed as the religion of the desert. Sharif S. El Musa, a scholar, poet and translator, goes so far as to suggest that the desert is to Arab culture what the forest is to European culture, a zone of intimate alterity which allows cultural definition. Therefore, I think it is no surprise that in his epic, Villeneuve turns to the visuals most grounded with the tradition of the desert Arab culture. Upon landing on the Arrakis, Lady Jessica's minimalist goth gown is replaced with a lush, ochre-coloured chiffon and satin dress that is worn with a decorative chain burqa. This can be seen as a respectful nod towards the traditions of the fantasy desert population, equally veiled and resembling the inhabitants of the Middle East countries. As mentioned before, Fremen are inspired by Tuareg people. This line of reference is further hinted and displayed via objects and music, a ruminative chance echoing in the city, 
giving the visuals an air of fantasy, mid-east spiritual esotericism. The city of Arakin, with its palace complex, is a perfect integration into its desert environment. Set up in the nest of surrounding mountains, the city is almost indistinguishable from the surrounding sandy, rocky landscape. Heavy, angular, chiseled trapezoid shapes bring to mind World War II bunkers, combined with the massive ziggurat builds of Mesopotamia or Teotihuacan temple complexes in Mexico, playing off of their naturally brutalist composition, form and massing. The Arakan Palace in of itself is a masterpiece of elevated restraint. Its steep, sharp monochromatic tiering, juxtaposed with abstract geometric ornamentation of metal breeze screens and dotted here and there with palm trees, serve a look of futurist neo-antiquity. It's like an institute of art would look like if it was designed in the middle of Jordan Desert. The interior of Arrakis are equally enthralling. Shielded from heavy sandstorms and merciless heat of the sun, the sequences of rooms have this cavernous feel inside and monochromatic look to them, all carved out in clear-cut lines from beige stone. Inside, we see a gorgeous, large-sized, beautiful, decorative bas-reliefs, which depict sandworms and koi fish, made in what looks like an ancient repoussé technique that is, hammering and shaping malleable metals by hand to achieve a relief-like effect of surface, a technique established and popular in antiquity. They seem to be made in bronze or brass, which, color-wise, only complement the subtle, understated monotonality of the browns and the beiges of everything else. The furnishings are sparse and feel like a carved-out part of the entire room. The overall feel seemed to strike a kind of archaeological, temple-like feel to it. And this is especially wittingly conferred in this scene by showing discovery of a walled-up Harkonnen assassin. This image subliminally suggests a kind of ancient tomb digging, giving off a further feel of antiquity to the entire place. Also, I feel like for some reason these interiors and the general overall look remind me of Rick Owens. I actually feel like this movie is set in Rick Owens and Michelle Lamy's universe. Their aesthetic is very aligned to that of the movie and I could definitely see them designing those spaces. Just look at Rick Owens' home and his furniture line. If you like the look and feel of Arakin, I think you should definitely get yourself acquainted with the works of Rick Owens and his amazing creative world. 4. Tech And as for the tech side of things, Dune doesn't disappoint in its approach as well. And with the plot happening in the year 10,191, how do you build upon this while not playing down the sense of relatability? Well, it's a post-computer, post-AI world according to Villeneuve. The tech seem to be an integrated part of everyday life, both figuratively and literally. It's all treated with decorative art, but moreover, it's reduced to the bare minimum necessary to function. We don't see screens, complex display CUIs, holographic communication. The dashboards are all manual, the gadgets are analog. What is refreshing in that scenario is that the combat relies on blade rather than ammo, which is a huge departure in that genre. When it comes to more complex technology and vehicle design, the inspiration relies heavily on insect world, as we see this with the hunter-catcher, a deadly remote-controlled weapon. Orthocopters are clearly inspired by dragonflies. Harkonnen spice diggers looks like ticks. Even when we look at inside of the tent, the lining, along with the pattern cast by the water recycling tubes, give off a look of butterfly wings. The tech strive to feel as naturalistic and organic as possible. Then we have spacecraft aspect, and here, we get a stark contrast to the previous naturalist inspiration. 
The spaceships are very abstract in their purest clay forms, and the degree of advancement achieved in this universe makes the space travel look so streamlined and elegant that it feels almost conceptual in its nature. Pure geometric forms graciously propel through space, almost in perfect silence. The lack of sign of exhaust pipe and complete smoothness of surface signify departure from any visibility of mechanics present in it, signifying a refined visual of completely concealed dynamics. The year is 10,191, and the space travel and its exhilarating performativity looks like art. 5. Conclusion I honestly love Dune. I was a bit skeptic about it at the beginning, with space feudalism, evil emperor and old prophecy at face value it landed for me too close to Star Wars a bit, but boy was I wrong. And I mean, of course, while operating within the same genre, there might be some suggestive overlaps if you go out of your way and look for it. But I think the movie makers did a really great job to escape that. I think Villeneuve had a very well brewed, unique vision and the movie finds its own voice and truly stands out on its own. It felt epic, elegant and mature in its treatment of subject matter and the world it creates. The visuals, references, the sound design, the camera work, all truly unrivaled. I loved that there was no pondering to fans, no comic-y over stylizations, no stupid and necessary sense of humor, all the vices of modern films that take me out instantly and make my eyes roll. It felt like a grown-up odyssey, not over-explaining everything, maintaining the mystique and allowing to obsess over the space of all things untold. Thank you Villeneuve for a brilliant piece of cinema, I honestly cannot wait for what's to come in sequel. And what did you think of the Dune? Did you like it? If so, let me know in the comments. Again, thanks so much for watching guys, and as always... Ben, ben.